So what is multimedia? I'm gonna talk about what multimedia is, some of the theories behind it, and then what the multimedia principles are. Um, basically just to give you an idea of what it is and what some of the research behind this really is. Um, so in the literature, you know, we define multimedia as a combination of both words and pictures. So, you know, two types of representations, verbal and nonverbal. So that could be like audio narration and images, graphs, charts, icons combined together. Um, the reason, you know, I have this operational definition of it is I've sat in a classroom and I've asked students, what is the definition of multimedia? And guess what? Either everyone's really silent, one brave soul will raise their hand and they'll say radio or newspaper or something like that. And not that they're incorrect. You know, we all use terms like this, but we have to really define them. So multimedia is a combination of two different types of representations, verbal, nonverbal. That means like images and text. That's what we've, we mean when we say multimedia, right? So we have this thing called the multimedia principle. It was developed by Meyer and colleagues. They've been writing about it for like 20 plus years since you know the 90s. They've been writing about this thing called the multimedia principle. But multimedia principle is not new. It's been written about since the 60s or 70s. We've been writing about multimedia. We know that words and images are better for learning than not. We've known this since since the 60s or 70s. You know, I have work cited from, you know, Dwyer and all kinds of people who have you know, written about this over and over again about how to develop instruction, cons develop instruction. So we have this thing called the multimedia principle. Multimedia principle says a combination of words and images, you know, the definition of multimedia, are better for learning than just words alone. Let me say it again. A combination of words and pictures is better for learning than just words alone. Very basic, right? And it makes sense. If I'm looking at a book, how many of you like to have some pictures in it? Or we look at a magazine, we have pictures, we watch video, we have, you know, pictures. We, you know, it makes sense that adding images to text helps us, can help us learn better. But you have to look at the research and say, is this what really happens when we test it? So let me talk about that. So first, let's let's go and talk about some of the theories behind this idea of multimedia learning. Um, first, we start out with information processing, and I'm not going through every theory that's ever contributed to this. I'm going through some of the main ones. We go through this theory of information processing. Information processing basically says that when we receive information, our brain kind of decides: Are we going to do something with this? Is this an image? Is this text? Is this narration? Are we just forgetting this? Is this not important? And then it goes into our short-term memory. From our short-term memory, we decide if we're how we're gonna what we're gonna do. Are we working with this? Are we gonna remember it and store it in our long-term memory? We work with it, right? It's called we refer to this as our working memory sometimes, right? Different authors, short-term working, <clears throat> you know, but they're the same thing: short-term and working. Um, when they're there. We say that in our short-term memory, we can hold about five to seven images or you know, concepts or ideas at one time. So we can work with about five to seven things. And while we're working with those five to seven things, we pull from our long-term memory to help us you know, piece things together and problem solve. We say our long-term memory is a place of in infinite storage, like a big, huge library where things are just stored there forever. That's what we refer to when we say our long-term memory. You know, and this idea of how much we can hold in our head, you know, was originally, you know, the, the big uh, paper by Miller in 1956 where he said we can hold plus or minus seven units in our head at one time, in our working memory at one time, depending on how interesting they are to us. Um, so that leads us to this thing called cognitive load and dual coding. And basically what cognitive load and dual coding mean is that so we know that this thing, multimedia, says we can store this verbal and nonverbal information, right? We can have this, we can store nonverbal and verbal information in our head. And we can, we, you know, they're, they're processed, you know, I can store a certain amount of verbal and a certain amount of nonverbal before I start forgetting things. So the idea here is that when I'm presenting someone with some type of content, I can present them with a few concepts at one time 
before I need to get them to remember them or discard them before going on to the next thing. So the idea is after I, if I try to give them like 12 concepts, we're gonna do something called overload their working memory. Think of a water, a glass, you're holding a glass here. And the amount of water I'm pouring in the glass is called cognitive load. The more this glass fills up, the more strain on our cognitive resources, right? The heavier the glass gets, eventually what happens? We get to the top of the glass, overflows, right? No more water, it's all dumped, you know, spilling everywhere. Our memory is no different than that glass of water. It's how we remember. Um, so we can only fill our memory up with so much information. So when you're doing like a presentation or computer-based training or a video or anything, you have to remember that if you're trying to get your users to remember something, you have to reinforce it, get them to remember it before moving on to new things or it's gone. It's, you're just continuously overflowing that cup, gone. They're forgetting it. So why is this important? We know it's important, right? It makes sense. We want to find the best possible way to deliver content to people so they actually remember it. This is important for CEOs doing a presentation to shareholders. This is important to anyone doing a presentation, a teacher doing a presentation to their students. It's important to an instructional designer developing instruction. You know, you have to, you know, know the best way to deliver content so your learners remember it. So from this idea that words and pictures are better for learning than just words alone. We came up with these principles called the multimedia principles. And I'm not gonna go through all of them. I'm gonna go through a few of them just to give you an idea of what they really stand for, and what, you know, what they do. Before I go through these, I wanna warn you, take these with a grain of salt. You know, we have research that shows, yes, these are like words and pictures are better for learning than just words alone. We have studies that show this. You know, in my research, I did a meta-analysis and I found that it's about 12% better. You know, overall, the, the images and text versus words at about 12%. And that all depends on so many variables. How motivated are your learners? Um, you know, do your learners have disabilities? If they can't see, words and pictures aren't helping them. Um, you know, do they have the technology to even see stuff? If, they're, if they have to read like we just have books that can't print well, then our only option is text. You know, I can't... You know, do they have good graphics? Can I develop good graphics? Do the learners like graphics? You know, what is their preference for graphics? All that kind of stuff goes into any of these principles I'm gonna go through. Take them all with a grain of salt. Do what's best for your learners, but know these and know, hey, if I can do this, I'm gonna do it because it could improve learning. You know, we're really learning some best practices here. So the first best practice is words and pictures that, you know, make sense together are better for learning than just words alone. First best practice, right? All right, and I'm gonna go through some of these now. All right, so the first one is called the split attention principle. And split attention principle and modality principle go hand in hand. So split attention principle basically means that if I'm looking at a picture and there's words on the screen that help me remember things that, you know, explain for the picture. I have an example on the screen here for those of you actually watching. For those listening, I'll just describe it. I have a picture on the screen and I have text that describes that picture. The split attention principle says that the learner has to look at the picture, go read the text. Go back to the picture, go read the text. Go back to the picture, go read the text in order to understand all the concepts on the screen. So what this is happening is something called representation holding. The learner's trying to hold something in their memory, go look at the picture. Hold the picture in their memory, go back to the images. What's happening? We're filling up that cup too fast. Cup is being filled up too quickly. So we have this thing called the modality. So split attention principle says we don't want to try to split things up like that. But obviously words and pictures on the same screen is good, right? We do that all the time. Yes, it is. As I said, take all these with a grain of salt. So we have the modality principle or modality effect. What that says is that narration, like spoken words and images are better for learning than words and pictures alone, like text and pictures. So what that means is that the learner can concentrate on the image and listen to all the content about the image. 
without having to go back and forth between the text and picture. All right, and that makes sense. Obviously, if your learners prefer or they need the text for some reason, you have it. But I'm saying best practice, words and pictures are better for learning than text and pictures. All right, that leads us to our next principle. And this is an interesting one because I'm going to talk about some of my research that I've done here on this. All right, so redundancy principle. That means presenting information, the same information two times, interferes with learning. It fills this cup up too quickly. What's an example? So if I go and I'm talking, I have an image on the screen and I have text on the screen. And at the same time that text is on the screen, I have someone reading the text like narration at the same time where the learners are trying to read that text, listen to the content and look at the image. No, we're hurting learning. The duplication of text and narration hurt learning. It's called the redundancy principle. The duplication hurts. Now, What's interesting about this is that as an instructional designer, there are times when, hey, I want them to listen and look at the picture, but you know what? I'm going to put an option on the screen for them to have the text pop up. Why? Because sometimes they need to study the text. It depends on what strategy I'm using. So, you know, there are reasons to do it. Now, what's interesting about this is I've done a few surveys on learner preferences. What do they like? What do they want? Every single one. Learners say, I prefer having both text and sound and images on the screen. They want it all. So my advice to you, if you are having the sound narration, have a little link that has the transcript that they can see it if they need to, to take notes or whatever they need it for. You know, if that's an option, remember, you're, we're developing this based on what our learners can what our options are for our learners and what they desire and for their learning. All right, next one, coherence principle. What does that mean? So this is an interesting one, and this goes back to the beginning when I said images and text that explain for one another are better than words alone. So what does it mean? Irrelevant images or irrelevant details hurt learning. Irrelevant images hurt learning. I always use this example. So I was at HR training and the theme was we're going to soar into the new year, which is like, okay. That's a cool theme. Every image had a picture of an airplane and I like airplanes. I think they're pretty cool. Like knowing like fighter jets and different kinds. And I, I think it's neat to look at them and they're such a cool piece of engineering, right? Um, so every screen, they had a different airplane on it, like in the corner had nothing to do with what the presentation, I mean, way nothing to do. The company's not, has nothing to do with planes. Um, every screen, I was concentrating on that airplane. What's the next airplane going to be? Is that one going to be a B-2 bomber? Um, you know, I was really curious because the presentation was so boring and that was what piqued my interest. It, the airplane gave me something else to focus on. Now that's an ex pretty extreme example, but it's a true example of what happened. Um, what I have on my screen here is two, I, I have an image of the heart on the screen. One is a plain drawing and one is a very detailed picture of a human heart. Now, if I'm trying to teach a medical student who knows what the heart looks like about the human heart and I'm talking about the symptom, why do I need a detailed picture of the septum when I can maybe just point to a simple line drawing? Do I need to have the color of it? Because I'm looking at, do I, the, are, is the color going to be distracting to them? Um, are different shapes of veins going to be distracting to them? What is going to be distracting to them? When do I have too many details versus not? So you have to think about it. Now, I'm not saying it's not some, it's, it's this cut and dry line of where you have too many details. Look at your learning objectives and say, what are my objectives? When I have too many details that I'm covering something not, that doesn't help the learners learn their learning objective, I have too much. All right? Very easy. All right. Spatial and temporal contiguity. Basically, what that means is if I have an image and text, they shouldn't be really far away from each other on the screen, they should be close. 
So the learner doesn't have to go, you know, back and forth, back and forth to find them. Simple. Also, they shouldn't be on separate screens. You don't have the image and then the text on the next screen. No, you have what the image and the text need to be on the same screen for the learners to learn it. Um, very basic. These are just some, some overall general good guidelines for design and development. Uh, you know, there's, there's nothing that's groundbreaking. I say each one of these and most people are like, oh yeah, that makes sense. Because it does. These all make sense. But you have to know best practices in order to make sense of them and then to use them. All right. Finally, we get to the, one of the last ones here, signaling. And basically what that means is signaling the learners that, hey, there's something important here, can help them remember. Think about like what an old college textbook used to have like a bolded word when it was an important word. Awesome strategy. That's a cue. It could be colored or bolded. Whenever you have a word, hey, important concept here. Remember this. You know, even just using metacognitive strategies like that, like some kind of advanced organizers or self-explain where you have a dot and you say, each time you see the dot, you know there's an important concept. Something like that. Beautiful strategy. Work wonders to get people to remember things. Um, so just some basic things. Another one is the interactive, uh, interactivity effect, which basically says, allow your learners to control the pace of the instruction. You know, have a next button, have a back button, have a replay button. Don't force them to read through 45 minutes of content without them being able to pause it. They need to be able to do that. Let them go through because people learn at different paces, much different paces. Some people learn at, you know, very steady line, whereas another person can learn in one second and another person takes three hours. If you have the option to give them that option, please do so. And those are just some basic things of the multimedia principle. Overall basic principle, what is multimedia? Images and text. Multimedia principle, images and text versus words are better for learning, right? And then we go into the other principles. Best practices, take them with a grain of salt. Thank you.